नमो तगवतो अर्हत संबुद्ध The subject of the discourse today is the series on nibbana. That is, what exactly is meant by enlightenment? Enlightenment is a very definite stage of spiritual attainment, and it is something that is the goal of every follower of Lord Buddha. So it is essential for every. Upasaka and Upasika, and those who are interested in the teachings of the Master, it is very essential they should have a clear understanding of what exactly is the Bana, enlightenment, which means freedom from samsaric existence. The north, the samsara means the wheel of recurring existence. Again and again one is born, again and again one dies, and again and again one is reborn. In between birth and death one acquires all kinds of karmas, both good and bad. And these karmas, that means actions, volitional actions, they have potency. Last time I mentioned about the karmic, the kamma sakti, uh, karma sakti, uh, or the karmic potency. The example I will repeat once again. Today we are going to, uh, uh, you see, we will use a number of similes uh, illustrating uh, or rather figurative expressions to uh, make uh, the, uh, the subject more clear. Now, potency, <coughs> the example given last time was, that it says, imagine a orange tree. Now, the orange tree has the potency or the power or the capacity to bear orange fruits year after year until the uh, tree becomes barren and cannot bear any more. So now, say the tree has borne a huge quantity of oranges and the owner is very happy and then as the season is over, oranges are over. Now if somebody says, now the tree, what is the, where lies the potency? How did the tree produce these fruits? Why is that power? So, a botanist or whatever it is, a pseudo-scientist, he goes about messing about with the tree. Cut this part, cut that part, look here, look there, all kinds of so-called scientific um, uh, investigation, meaning nothing really. And then, he doesn't get any sign of any potency at all. So he says, ah, oh, no, there's no potency left. But then, in the next uh, season, <coughs> the tree bears abundant fruit again. And this happens year after year. So, has the tree lost its potency during the, uh, un the uh, when the season is not there? No. So in course of our samsaric journey, we have lived hundreds and thousands of lives in all kinds of, um, uh, in, uh, you know, different forms and in different planes of existence. Sometimes as a human being, born as a human being, sometimes as a deva, sometimes maybe as a ghost, or sometimes maybe as an animal. Or even, you see, other creatures in the subhuman state of existence, the apaika. There are four such stages of subhuman existence where beings suffer immensely indeed, in hundred different ways. That's a plane only for undergoing suffering and misery. So, 
in all these different planes. Now, above the in the human plane, we experience both suffering and pain, both pain and pleasure. And this is because of the mixed type of karmas that we commit, both good and bad. Now, in the lower planes, it's all the result of evil karma. And it's all pain, pain, pain. Now, in the higher than human beings, the devas and the brahmas and so on, there is the result of good karmas. Where uh, it's not a mixed karma or any evil karma, it's plain and simple, uh, good, meritorious deeds, punya karma with a tremendous potency of bringing happiness of all kinds. The devas enjoy long life, very blissful existence, and so on. They have immense uh, uh, powers, psych uh, various psychic powers and supernormal powers, and very high level of intelligence. They don't suffer in the way that we human beings suffer. So now, that play, even though it is a long life and everything is so blissful and good and all that, even that comes to an end because the potency is always limited. It is limited by uh, time factor, so the longevity factor. Now, for instance, a medicine has got a potency and it will work say within such and such time so it's time barred and after the moment the time is gone it expires so that potency of the medicine is gone it will no longer be effective it has to be thrown away similarly now when the effect of the good karma the result of good karma is exhausted finished then the being automatically also uh, passes away from that plane. Because that, the access into that plane was based upon the potency of the karma, good karma. And the exit from that plane is equally due to the ex exhaustion of the karmic potency. So on. Now, so uh, the... Once we understand the nature of potency in karma, every action that we do, everything that we say, everything that we think, by way of volitional, willful, intentional action, not just unintentional uh, mechanical action, no. Only uh, willful and volitional action, intentional, they have the potency and they can bring all this. Some wandering in the samsara, life after life, life after life, endlessly is the true nature of dukkha, the metaphysical aspect of suffering. And it is to be free from that, that one takes to spiritual life and one practices the teachings of the Buddha as a bhikkhu or bhikkhuni, upasaka or upasika. Now, uh, the freedom from this bondage, the karma rebirth bondage, freedom from that is Nibbana. What is it that ties a being or ties the mind into this recurring existence? To be born again and again and die and all that. To this karmic involvement. What is it? So now, there are ten such fetters. Fetter means bandhana, a tie, something which binds and ties. <coughs> now, the bandhanas are, first of all, the sense of I. The sense that I am something independent, free, and some entity by itself, and though the body undergoes death, but this I does not. Or even if you don't have such 
uh, wrong views about a permanent entity and all that sort of thing. Even if you are a, uh, if you are convinced that no, there is no such thing. Even then, the now for instance, a being uh, refers himself or herself as I. It's my son. It's my family. It's my uh, property. So this I sense is a very very uh, profoundly, um, uh, you know. It profoundly affects our life and our conduct, our karmas. So that's a big factor, the biggest in fact. And once that is destroyed, along with that, some other factors are also destroyed. Like mistrust, doubt, skepticism, or the close-mindedness, dogmatic fixation of mind. These are all factors. Then belief in rites and ritual that external activity by itself will free oneself, so will bring about spiritual development. No. Unless the mind is involved and mind undergoes a state of purification, there is no spiritual development whatsoever. So, the, um, these three factors, the self-illusion, uh, doubt, skepticism, cynicism, and mistrust, suspicion, and then belief in the superstitious belief and adherence in external practices. That they are by themselves, they have an efficacy, and so on. Now, this, these three are really gross type of uh, fetters. They bind a being in samsara ad infinitum. Infinitely you keep on being born and dying and again and again coming. So now there are two more. One is, let us say, the sensual desire, sensual lust, this, uh, this bondage in sex life. That's a terribly, uh, terrible uh, uh, factor once again. And then it's opposite, anger, hatred, uh, meanness, jealousy, the negative aspect of the desire. So these five constitutes very uh, strong and coarse and grosser fetter. There are five more which are subtle. So let us say uh, a kind of sense of superiority. By in fact, whether you are, uh, you see, they say I am born Brahmin, I am born a white man, I am born a Japanese, so I am automatically superior to others. This kind of, uh, you know, the caste and class system and distinctions and all that. This is this kind of egotism, conceit, self-conceit, is also a very big uh, factor. Restlessness of mind. Just the mind roams about from here to there, restless, and therefore it brings worry of all kinds. That's a factor. Avijja. Then, uh, you see, um, the sheer ignorance and the delusion. That's a very big factor. And then, you may not have the sensual desire of the Kama Loka, but there is desire in the Rupa Loka and Arupa Loka also, in the Brahma Loka. It's a kind of desire pertaining to that plane of existence where they want to continue to exist. So the craving is craving for sensual pleasures, craving for, to come for survival and continue to exist and be in samsara, and also in Arupa Loka is the same continuation. So these are the five, these subtle five and the gross five makes ten fetters. Now these ten fetters keep a being, you see, tied to the wheel of existence. Ad infinitum, there is no end to this. Aimlessly and endlessly a being 
roams, wanders in samsara. So those beings who have become spiritually matured, who have understood that, no, there is no end to this. There is no end to acquisition, no end to collection, no end to grasping. The more you have, the more you want. So endless it is. And similarly, no, no end of violence. You can never... Uh, <coughs> overcome violence by violence. You can never solve the problem of violence with another type of violence. It's endless again. Various delusive beliefs and uh, views, etc. Those are also endless. So now, once a person becomes mature enough to know there is no end to this, and we get involved in our own activities, our destiny is created by ourselves, is not created by any god or any guru or any religion or any other uh, external agency. It is just plain our own activities. We are responsible for our activities and we have to pay a price for that in the form of the um, acquiring karmic potency and therefore the potency must give result. Potency simply means, a karma's potency simply means that the ability of the karma to produce a result. Whether the result is produced in the form uh, here and now result, you go and abuse somebody and get a slap. That's an here and now result of this. You are being cruel, troublesome, you torture people, you get caught and you are in jail. This kind of day-to-day -day effect, that's one type of effect here and now. Uh, they are not strong um, potent potencies. Then there are others who are very strong. They are capable of producing result in the form of rebirth, whether in the human plane or subhuman plane or uh, higher than human planes, in the divine planes and Brahma planes and so on. So now, freedom from these fetters. If a person practices sila regularly and very devoutly, very sincerely, the person will definitely weaken number of these fetters, if not destroy them. And along with that one meditates and purifies the mind. By Srila you purify the mind up to a point where, uh, you see, you are no longer a servant of your own instinct, but you have self-control. You develop mastery over your actions and your conduct. And to that extent the mind gets purified. And since you don't do anything evil, you only do uh, good deeds, meritorious deeds, the result is always happy and good. So now, this uh, potency, the karmic potency, once we understand that it's through karma only we get involved and we have to pay a price, here and now and hereafter. If it is a good karma, a superior type of human life, uh, or in Deva Lokas, or if you meditate and get uh, samadhi and all that, Brahma Loka. Long, long life in aeons is not a question of year, it's a question of aeon, kalpa. So all these uh, blissful existences they are, but they also come to an end because they are produ products of karma. So if any person is mature enough wants to get out of the karma bandhana, the fetters created by this karmic uh, the activity, our own activities, one who wants to be free, wants to be master of his activities and go beyond activities, beyond both good and bad karmas. Such a person develops the Noble Eightfold Path, which consists of Sila, Samadhi, Panya, 
virtuous conduct, sila, samadhi, mental purification and development through meditation, and panya, development of wisdom, and therewith cut at the very root of the fetters and mental defilements. So, this threefold training is Noble Eightfold Path, and threefold development based upon the training. So, as we train the mind in this way, and purify the mind, a time comes when the mind is purified totally. And then, the, these fetters, the grosser ones, are destroyed by the power of the potency of Panya, wisdom. And in this case, Vipassana wisdom. Vipassana here means a direct experience of reality. You see. Which is different from knowledge of reality. Now, for instance, I'll give an example here. An illustration will be useful. Now, a person uh, wants to be free. So he is given a... Uh, uh, he said, well, you follow this path and you will reach Nibbana. So Nibbana is a process of... By Nibbana is meant a process of enlightenment, which means freedom from samsaric existence and freedom from these fetters. The more fetters you eliminate, the higher you go and nearer the final uh, Nibbana. So now this person takes a uh, journey on the Noble Eightfold Path and then there are four distinct stages of uh, super mundane experience. In the, they are like, let's say, four mountains all joined together. One, the mountain tops, the summits of four mountains in four different levels. The first level, uh, let's say, um, uh, 30,000, second level, 22,000, third level, 24, fourth level, 29. You reach, uh, go to the uh, Mount Everest, above sea level. So now you have reached the 20th and you come to a, at the top of the mountain and you experience something so totally different. It is, this mountain here at top is a plateau, it's a flat land. And this flat plateau leads to another plateau, another plateau in four different plateaus. So now, reaching there, what happens? Now you have carried five big bundles with you because you need to, on your way, you think you need all this. And five smaller bundles, rather very light bundles. Now once you reach the first uh, level of the plateau, out of these five, three big ones are dropped and thrown away. You become unburdened, disburdened, and very light. And your mind undergoes a complete transformation. Last time we gave an example of what uh, transformation of the mind is meant by. Now the example of milk, then butter, and milk, uh, then a curd, then butter, then butter oil, and then ghee in these four stages. Once the milk can remain for a day or two or three, and then it will rot. Uh, the curd will go a little more further, a few, maybe a week, then it will soil, it will become sour. Then butter, it will remain longer, maybe 15 days or a month. Then it will again also become, uh, it will have smell and all that sort of thing. Then you uh, make a butter oil on that to clarify it. And uh, it still has got some, uh, something to be, uh, you see, uh, something to be removed. But it will uh, keep for a longer period, maybe three or six months. But once you turn it into a pure, pure ghee, 
and there is no dirt whatsoever left. Now, why at that stage you can keep it for years together? That is transformation in four different stages. Once you become curd, it will never become milk. And you become, uh, you see, once you have butter, it will never become curd or milk. Once the butter oil, similarly. And once it is ghee, it's impossible, it's irreversible state. So in the first plateau, let us call it Sotapati Magga Phala. That is the stage of enlightenment known as Sotapanna, one who has entered the stream of Nibbana, whereby you automatically within seven lives you uh, get, uh, you reach Nibbana. In the final stage and become an Arhat. Automatic. No more than seven lives. Now before this, you can be born a hundred times, thousand times, million times. How? Well, all the karmas we have done in the past, they have their potency. And they have not given result as yet. There are karmas which produce here and now result. There are karmas which produce result only in the next life. And there are karmas which produce result thereafter, not just the next life, but life after that, life after that, many, many lives ad infinitum. Ditha Dhamma, Upapaja, Aparaparya, and Ahosikam. It is said. So now, Akaratakam. Mm. And there are other karmas which Stay put for a long, long time until you get enlightened. Any number of lives, they are there. Their potency is so great, so long. So now, the karmas we have got, within the karma potency, karmic potency within ourselves, in the mind, in the mind is a carrier of karmic force. The consciousness, each state of consciousness is a very powerful, uh, dynamic state. So much of potency it carries of all entire past. Unimaginably powerful indeed. Both in the negative way and in the positive way. So now, the karmas which are we are carrying with us, let's say which will produce only in the next life. So you are not going to, you are not rid of them now in this life, or next life and next life and next life. Only when so the time, first of all, time factor. So these karmas will mature in terms of time. And then in terms of opportunity, there are karmas, let's say in this life itself, they will get matured. And, but if the proper opportunity is not there, then they won't get appro ma matured and they will get matured only in the next. So you carry forward with it. So this, now, once you become a Sota Panna, you are totally free from all these karmic potencies which are capable of leading you ad infinitum. Endlessly you can be born, you are being born, you will die, and while dying, since you have accumulated fresh karmas, you will be reborn, along with the stored karma that you have got already. So now this karmic potential, it is this that is responsible for samsaric wandering, wandering in the wilderness of samsara, endlessly and aimlessly. So now, anyone who is serious and wants to get out of all this, the process is enlightenment. So you train yourself, hard work, even to earn money to eat, you have to have work hard. So how much more hard work should it be to be free from our bondage? 
So some God comes and frees you is a cock and bull story. As plain as that. You have created karma and you have to get liberated from that. Others can show you the path but they can't walk for you. You have to walk. Now this must be fully understood. So a person seeking enlightenment must have no illusion whatsoever that only by self-effort, effort, 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 that you can gain. Enlightenment, the first stage of it is Sotapanna. Last time I just briefly said, today I have given, uh, you know, described a little more fully. This is a very, very profound subject, my dears. This is not a simple thing that you can just swallow and digest, no. It requires time. And it requires uh, a great deal of effort and uh, perseverance to know so that you will be able to practice. And to know and practice so that you will realize enlightenment. And that is possible. So now, and you throw away at least the, the three big bundles and get this burden, and light and happy and transformed. Your mind is totally different. You cannot again, uh, you see, no falling back into samsari. You are within seven lifetimes, you are bound to get Nibbana. Now, what kind of seven lifetime it will be? And then, when you get this. Uh, state of enlightenment, what exactly is meant by that enlightenment experience, which is known as Magga. It is like when you access into the plateau, that means you have arrived at the plateau, and your mind is totally freed and transformed. It's, you, are, you are spellbound by the sheer sublimity and transcendental quality of that state. It's indescribable. Because there is nothing in this world which is comparable to that. You can describe a thing only with analogies and concepts. And with existing, uh, you see, uh, figuratively you can, existing things. But there is nothing in samsara. There is nothing in any plane of existence. Which, reflect, which can show the nature of Nibbana. So when you are unenlightened, you can't talk of enlightenment beings. You can describe, because you have heard, you have read in the book, your guru has told you, but you have not experienced. So experiential knowledge is one and conceptual knowledge is quite another. So at this stage of Sotapanna when you en enter this uh, Magga stage and then is followed by Phala, that's a profoundly wonderful experience and that would be the subject of the discourse next time. With this I conclude May the grace of Bhagavan Buddha, supremely enlightened master of both gods and humans. May the blessings of the Buddha, his Dhamma and Sangha, the path of enlightenment, and those who are the guide, guides to that path, the enlightened ones themselves, may by their grace all of you enjoy the best of health and peace of mind, May your lives be surrounded by well-being and wisdom. May you have that great, that aspiration, that aspiration for freedom, aspiration for enlightenment. Sukhino Bhavantu, may you all be happy.